Please rise for the presentation of the colors. Color guard attention. Color guard advance. the colors. Would the audience please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Color guard, dismiss. The audience may be seated. Thank you very much, everyone.
take pictures and pin her. And so I'd like to invite Leslie Eschen to come forward. Thank you, Leslie. to acknowledge Leslie, Leslie Eschen with the 2019 Difference Maker Award. Leslie and her husband, Mark, who was just up here a few minutes ago, are very active PTA members. Their three children attended John Muir over 12 consecutive years. Leslie's dedication and efforts to make John Muir School an exceptional place to learn has been ongoing and outstanding. This is Leslie's fourth year as a library media aide. She is an enthusiastic reader and shares her love of literature with our students and teachers. Mrs. Eshna also works hard to get to know our students and what they like to read. She reads books daily with individuals and small groups, works hard to get the right book into the hands of every student, reads to all classes when they visit the library. She has diligently, she has worked diligently to weed, I don't know what that's like, weed, <laughs> repair and catalog books. And I love how she recovered old copies of The Secret Garden, did a few book talks, and then students fought to check the books out. <laughs> Leslie calls the children by name and knows their reading interest, and she is instrumental in bringing the Little Library program to San Bernardino Park, and she oversees ours. The Little Library is an integral part of our school culture. Parents and students routinely take and donate books to our Little Library. She has implemented the Birthday Book Club, trained student pages, facility that manages our book fair and much more. You are indispensable, Leslie. It takes a lot of energy to catalog, we repair inventory and order library books. And Leslie has spent many hours of her own time doing this. This summer she works several additional days to ready our books and to prepare our library for our students. And she does this on an ongoing basis. Our library has never looked better. And I was over there yesterday and I have to attest to that. Every school should have a Leslie session. So we're wanting to know how we can duplicate you. <laughs> She brings reading to life for the students of John Muir, and we want to say thank you and congratulations. So um, we have this pen for the difference maker for you. I think it's very fitting. We're sort of honoring husband and wife tonight. Leslie Eschen is our difference maker. And we are going to showcase scouting because scouting at John Muir School has been a long-term program. Boy Scout Troop 72, which part of, uh, some of the boys are here tonight, and Scout, Cub Scout Pack 290 have had a wonderful relationship and home at John Muir School for the past 10 years. Um, our Cub Scouts meet once a month at John Muir and the Boy Scouts meet weekly. This photo is a picture from about two or three weeks ago when our Weeblo Boy Cub Scouts bridged into Pack, uh, Troop 72. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's very nice to have both groups at school at John Muir because it feeds the Boy Scout troop. Um, oh, and in 2018, we have 
a second grade Girl Scout troop, which has started and meets monthly at John Muir. And both of these groups, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, have sweat equity agreements. That term was coined by a couple of superintendents ago. And instead of paying money to use our schools, they provide a set number of work hours every year. And both of these groups greatly exceed the required number of work hours. And quite honestly, we're on the very, very beneficial receiving end. And because um, what they do is a tremendous help to John Muir School. And our new Girl Scouts, they work with our PTA to run the family um, bingo night in the fall. They organize and run the snacks, and they do all the setup and cleanup, and they also, this will be the second year that they're working with um, Jennifer Blanco's group for, is it Day of the Child, April 24th? Children's Day. Children's Day. April 27th. April 27th. I know it's coming up, and um, that is also our Girl Scout troop. The Boy Scouts, who are um, showcasing tonight, they do all kinds of things at John Muir School. They do all the cooking and the cleanup at our annual pancake breakfast. They rake tan bark and pick up trash along Crestmore Drive on a regular basis. In fact, the hill below Skyline Boulevard, Mark, is looking a bit dirty, so we'll, we'll put that on your list. It's a bit messy. It's very windy up at John Muir School. Um, the scouts work at every school beautification day. They have pulled the weeds, planted flowers and plants all over our campus in the past 10 years. In fact, we had one group um, spent all day wheelbarrow barrowing mulch from the parking lot to the area by our marquee on Crestmore Drive. And that's another thing we have to do. The weeds are coming back. Um, basically, whenever I need something done quickly and done well, I call the scouts. And these, as I said, the sweat equity agreements have been a win-win agreement. We get the better part of the agreement. Um, one thing that is pretty exciting is that Troop 72 has completed seven Eagle Scout projects in the past 10 years on the John Muir School campus. And they have included um, treks, benches in our outdoor classroom between our parking lot and the cafeteria. That's a beautiful place. We've had two projects of backpack hooks and shelves. There are over 40 shelves total throughout our school. We had a safety painting of the playground poles, the door swings, classroom lineup numbers on the playground, and fire drill lineup numbers. Um, a more recent one, in fact, it was Leslie Eschen's son who did um, the two brand new John Muir signs. They graced the front of our school and the back gate. And the one at the front of the, our school has a little top part that says, Welcome to John, Welcome to, and below it says John Muir. And we can open up the Welcome to, and it says, Minimum day today. So I love that. Um, and then our most recent project was a 75-foot retaining wall, which John Daly has said looks exceedingly professional. So we're going to wait until the remodel is well planned and see where it takes us before we put in the second side. If it has to be removed, we will have the scouts dismantle it and figure out what we're going to do with it. And we have another scout who is working on the 8th Eagle Scout project at John Muir School, and I would like to introduce to you my former kindergarten student, Reese Gerard. Uh, hello, my name is Reese Gerard. I'm a senior at Mills High School, and I attended John Muir School. Um, I'm an Eagle Scout candidate, and my project uh, will be building friendship benches at John Muir. I'm going to build and install two friendship benches on the playgrounds. Um, these benches will be blue and white, which is different from all the other benches on the campus. And students will be able to go to these friendship benches during recesses when they want to play with someone, and then someone will come uh, to join them. Uh, student, uh, I will also provide teachers with lesson plans to uh, train students 
um, how to use the benches. And I'm also going to build two plain blue benches to add additional seating to the courtyard area for lunchtime. Um, and the, the thing about these benches is they have to be, they have to have special legs so they can be um, strapped down and then later removed if they have to be for the remodel. Um, Boy Scout Troop 72 and Cub Scout Pack 290 appreciate being part of the John Muir School community. Um, on March 2nd at the Discovery District Awards Dinner, the Pacific Skyline Council acknowledged John Muir Elementary School with the 2019 Community Leadership Award in recognition and appreciation of a decade of strong and enduring support for the Boy Scout program in San Bruno. That's what, that's what this is. <laughs> um, we're most thankful to the John Muir School community for their long and continued support. job with him in kindergarten. <laughs> Actually, I only had him for a month because that was the year I became principal. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to read all the data. I think it's pretty clear. And um, this is the overall SBAC. Actually, this is, should be ELA. And this slide is for ELA for the SBAC total for 2018. And although many of the students have met the standard, there's always room for improvement. Um, one strong point is that the district, the distance, average distance from level three is very strong. It's 28. And then as we look at the three-year comparison of the SBAC for ELA, this shows um, each year all the grades together. And there's been a steady increase in the percentage of students meeting the standard over the past three years. And um, there's been a strong increase in the distance from level three. It went from plus two to plus 15. And this is the ELA cohort. I don't know. I, I was updating it. I must have taken out something. Apologize. And so this is a cohort of the same group of students from third, fourth, and fifth grade. That's why the uh, actual numbers are smaller. And there is an overall increase in students meeting the standards from third to fifth, third to fifth grade. There was a slight dip in fourth to fifth. And then, um, again, there's always room for increase. Another strong point is that there was a strong increase from level three, the distance from level three from third to fourth grade. Um, there was a decline in fifth grade, but there was an overall increase of plus 22 points. Okay, so this one is labeled correctly. It's the mid-year rent start for English language arts. And um, our fifth grade has the uh, highest number of students not meeting the benchmark at uh, their below grade level or at intervention. And again, this is an area that needs to be improved. And so some of the resources that we use we will use actual paper and pencil kinds of resources from Eureka Rap Map, from Renstar. Imagine Learning and CERN are actually online. But sometimes the teachers will pull teachable lessons from those for small group instruction based on student need. And um, then after they do the instruction, they'll do individualized assignments and individualized computer assignments. And as I said, we use um, 
uh, Renstar and Imagine Learning are, uh, the data is analyzed and used to um, form small groups for instruction, and then that's how teachers align the resources to meet the student needs. And this one is SBAC Math, and it's um, all the whole school for 2018. And again, the results are similar to our ELA. There is a, uh, a good percentage of students meeting the achievement, and the average distance from level three is quite strong at 24. And this is the three-year comparison for math. And again, I apologize, I don't know where that went. Um, and this is, again, the for three years, every year it's all three grades being compared, uh, being totaled together and then compared. And again, there's a strong um, distance from level three for 15, 16, and 16, 17. And it, the average distance in 17, 18 did dip, but it was still at plus five. And again, there's repeating um, that we have room for improvement. And this one is the SBAC math. It's the three-year cohort. So again, it's the students who were uh, attended John Muir School in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And the percentage of students meeting the standard ping pong did it went up and down and all around. And the distance from level three was strong in third and third and fourth grade, and it went down in fifth grade. And this is the mid-year Ren Star. It's math for second through fifth grades. And this is again similar data to our EL. And in fourth grade, and then in second grade, those are the two grades that had the most students at approaching and at or above grade level. And um, the largest group of students scoring below grade level and in intervention were in third grade, followed by fifth. And this is our LPAC data. This is um, the summative assessment from 2018. So it is, um, we've had changes since then. But we, third, we uh, currently, out of our 56% of students for reclassification, we're reclassifying, um, I think it's 27 out of 28 of them who are ready to be reclassified, very strong. And um, our least number of students is at level one, those are our beginning students. We tend to get students who, the, the level ones, they're the ones who are new to the country, usually. And um, in the last three to five years, we've had an increase in the number of Portuguese-speaking students that come from Brazil. And um, they tend to be quiet for a while, and then they soar. It's amazing. It's truly that they're, they're taking it in, and then the language comes bubbling out. Okay, and these are our findings and actions. And we use a lot of, um, da our data analysis is ongoing, and teachers, we, we do the district-based assessments, teachers do classroom assessments, and there are more assessments that need to be done when it's report card time. So this is an ongoing, very, uh, fluid system and we look at all of our students. We don't just look at our students with the greatest needs. We're also concerned about the students um, who need to be challenged at the top as well because that's equally important. Our, our goal is that every child learns and just because you come in a higher means you need to be met at that level. And we use the cycle of inquiry. We select focal students, set goals and interventions, 
And then we come back and say, did this work? If it didn't work, why? If it did, let's make sure we use that again. Um, differentiated instruction is used to meet individual student needs, and we also do uh, grouping to, to, to differentiate. And intervention can include small group instruction based on need, differentiated assignments and homework as needed, modified or alternative assignments as needed. We also have a um, reading intervention program that's been taught by retired teachers, and both of the retired teachers, um, Antelar and Marlene Morris, are uh, reading recovery specialists. So we're quite um, fortunate for that. And then, Looking at our smarter balance, the areas of listening and speaking are areas of needs, and that will be um, the EL focus for the remainder of this year and for next year. And next year, we're gonna just tear it apart, take a good look at it, see how it's defined, and see how it's measured. So we know what exactly we're supposed to be teaching, how we're going to teach it, and how it's gonna be measured. And then for math, very similar actions. Again, data analysis, cycle of inquiry, di differentiated instruction, small group instruction based on needs. Um, and our resources, Eureka Math has a wealth of resources. Red Star is the new assessment program, which also provides great data for uh, planning instruction and resources. And then Zern is a free online website that is aligned to Eureka Math, and that's very helpful. And students can assess it, access it at home, provides videos, and so if a parent doesn't know how to do something or needs a refresher, they can get a video of that day's lesson. And then that's our amazing faculty. We were um, donations for Halloween. So, I, and I couldn't do what I do without the, the wonderful people uh, at John Muir site. We have an amazing faculty and staff, and um, they do a wonderful job. Uh, any questions? Uh, you do see two back there, right? Yeah. They dressed me. <laughs>
So for systems and organization, there's a really unique opportunity and tremendous potential in needing to build process from the ground up, which is the situation that we found ourselves in this year. It allowed us to really examine and customize our practices to meet the needs, rather than continuing to do something one way because it's the way that it's always been done. So while it was a lot of work, and it was a challenging undertaking, it was also really exciting to work towards increasing our compliance and efficiency. Yes, thank you. Uh, I timed myself in preparation for this presentation so I can tell you with certainty that I could go on for 23 minutes on this slide alone, <laughs> which I will not. Um, instead, I think it would be helpful if I highlighted the, the two main universal whys behind the what's. Why we chose to focus on these areas as some of the highlights for developing our systems and organization. Uh, first and foremost, we are in the business of people. Everything we do is people oriented and it's a service business. We have a moral and ethical imperative to provide the highest quality of services to students and families. And it's essential that we have the structures in place to be able to support that work. The second main why is that we know that special education is an incredibly expensive venture. And um, our, our, every dollar that we save can be put right back into the pockets of our staff when it's time to renegotiate salaries, and that's something that we take very seriously. Our sub-wide average local contribution, so over and above percentage of funding that we receive from state and federal resources, is 74% in San Mateo County. So we're funded at 26% for what we really need to do on average as a county. Um, our local contribution last year was 71%. Next year I want to report that we were in the 60s. I think everything that we can do to provide organized and data-driven decisions will help us become more fiscally responsible and, and more solvent as we develop our program models and, and delivery. Um, going back to that 23 minutes, I can provide as many details as you want on this later. Um, but I think that the, the really big takeaway is that we're looking at everything that we're doing behind the scenes to support the most important stakeholders, our students, families, and staff, and putting process and systems in place to allow them to streamline the work that they're doing. It was made clear to me very beginning, uh, from the very beginning, even during the interview process, that repairing relationships and building trust was an essential undertaking. Um, to be quite honest, the sheer amount of work that, um, that we had to take on in the very beginning created some real capacity challenges. And we weren't able to meet the targets that we wanted to meet in the beginning of the year with timeliness of communication, setting up parent meetings, and doing everything that we could to take on this work. Um, I'm excited about the progress that we've made in this area, and I couldn't have done it without some really powerful and motivating parent partners. Um, and I look forward to continued and expanded collaboration and progress. Our job as a district is to support families as much as we can, as early on as we can, and as comprehensively as possible. The system can be emotional and challenging to navigate, and we are charged with the responsibility of demystifying the process and making it as accessible and positive and productive and effective as we can. Nothing that we do should be a secret. Nothing that we do should be done in isolation. There should never be a question that we can't or don't want to answer. Parents shouldn't walk into an IEP meeting being fearful of what awaits them. It should be an opportunity for us to really work together as a strong team on behalf of the students. It's essential that we, uh, that we ensure that parents are educated about their rights, that our teams are maximizing the opportunity for meaningful participation, and that IEP meetings become a place of growth and development and possibility. The words in the green box are more than just a page filler. Um, it's an honest, heartfelt, they're honest, heartfelt principles that I use to guide my work every day, um, particularly in the area of parent engagement. Staffing was our third main area of focus this year, and we have some real barriers to overcome here. Um, it's no secret there's a staffing shortage across the Bay Area, um, for all types of special education providers, te teachers, service providers. Um, and our work this year has been an exploration into how we can go over and under and around all those barriers that our county partners are also trying to solve and come up with the most creative solutions possible. 
nothing less than 100% staffing is acceptable. So while we do have challenges with open positions on and off throughout the year as things change, I want to assure you that we are, when we're not meeting that 100% target, the need is top of mind and high on our priority list each and every day. Currently, right now, for vacancies, we have a .6 open SLPs, a speech and language pathologist, serving some of our preschool students. Um, and that's been open since January. And it's really difficult for continuing to try to find someone this year. Um, but what we're doing to try to recoup some of the, um, the time that's been lost for such a young population is developing an intensive language immersion program over the summer, where students will get over and above the time that they've missed in an effort to do everything that we can to help them build skills and, and decrease the regression and recruitment period as we go into the year fully staffed for SLPs next year and are able to continue the progress that they make. We also have two A positions that are allocated and not yet filled in preschool special day classes at Bel Air. Uh, we've been filling in with subs. Um, so a need is being met that we don't have district hires in those positions. We're also right now conducting a careful position control analysis to look at our existing allocations across special, ed special education staff um, and working collaboratively um, with our union leaders and our teachers to look at the staffing ratios that we're using and also examine um, the hours, particularly for our instructional aides, to ensure that we're staffing programs based on student need based on service counts and not head counts, based on minutes so that we can meet our obligations to serve all students without any kind of staffing barriers because of positions that we've allocated. So we want to make sure that, again, it's not just we're doing this because this is always what's been done, but we're dialed into, we know we're meeting the needs. Um, right now we're making the job fair rounds, we're conducting interviews for next year already, and prioritizing filling vacancies as early as possible so that we can come as close as we can, hopefully 100%, um, to meeting that 100% target for the 2019-2020 school year. So this work will continue. But as we build capacity and as we make progress, we're able to start taking on more initiatives and continuing to build the, the program and the department. Um, so our work in those three areas will continue into next year, but the progress we've made um, has allowed us to identify three additional areas of focus for next year. And we identify these areas through um, stakeholder engagement and our investigative process, lovingly referred to as picking up rocks and turning them over and seeing what's underneath, as well as taking a, a broad overview of backwards planning, if you will, of looking at where do we want to be in five years and how are we going to put those, those supports and the process in place to be able to get there. So we're looking at the now and we're looking at the later. Um, so the, the targeted areas of focus that we're adding are program design, professional development, and enhanced collaboration. Being a small school district can present challenges in building programs that will meet the needs of all students. Larger districts have a lot of programs and it's easier to have a broader continuum. But that difficulty does not absolve us of our responsibility to do so. Through careful examination of our current and projected student needs, we've identified opportunities for both expanding our inclusive offer offerings and broadening our program continuum. So for inclusive practices, students have a right and we have an obligation to, to educate them in the least restrictive environment, which means being with their general education peers to the greatest extent possible. Anytime we pull them out to deliver services is restricting their school experience. So one of the things that we want to do is look at our inclusive practices in our existing programs, um, particularly as we're looking to align with um, what the high school district is doing as we're to, uh, expanding our programs at Parkside to help students have a smoother transition and build those independent skills so that their, their high school experience will be more successful. Um, eventually, I'd love to be able to report that we're doing co-teaching in the middle school um, we definitely want to increase our mainstreaming in the, in the special day classes and ensure that when we're doing push-in service, it's not just a body in a room that we're counting as service minutes, but it's really effective and really dialed into the types of supports that students need. Our, uh, we're also looking at program expansion, so building the programs that we have to meet the, the needs of the students in our district who don't currently have a place that's just right for them. 
So some of those opportunities include a therapeutic special day class. That's for students who have an underlying emotional need that's resulting in academic, behavioral, or social needs that are manifesting in their classrooms. So we're looking at that. Um, that will help us prevent potential out-of-district placements at non-public schools. So again, looking at how we can build our own internal capacity to reduce our fiscal, um, or be more fiscally responsible with, with where we're spending our money. Um, and most importantly, keeping the students with their community and their peers and their neighborhoods. Um, other program expansion opportunities include um, partnering with our state preschool and the county office to develop an inclusive preschool model, um, as well as providing more targeted social skills enrichment opportunities for our students on the autism spectrum, who especially as we look at our common core curriculum and the demand for students to communicate in an academic setting. We need to be thinking about academic communication language and building those skills for students whose disabilities may present them with some potential difficulties in that academic area. In order to do all of this, it's imperative that we provide our staff with the support and resources necessary to maximize the student outcomes. We've started and will continue the process of conducting a needs assessment that will guide the PD offerings for both our certificated and classified staff members. In addition to increasing the opportunity for our staff members to get together and learn from each other, we know we need to provide ongoing targeted areas of training that are more than just one conversation on one day. We need to provide research-based resources to address identified needs and weave a continuous thread of professional learning that we keep coming back to and reflecting on all throughout the year. We know that we can't do this work alone and we're seeking experts in the field and other partners that we can engage with to help us in this pursuit. We also recognize our need to broaden our work beyond the scope of just the special education department. There are so many people with incredible talents in the district that we can engage in this work together. Um, if they can add perspective and insight and knowledge and skills and talents and it's just so full of potential. Um, so we need to make sure that we're building opportunities for, for that collaboration. Um, and then we've also spent time identifying and beginning to build partnerships with outside um, organizations and partnerships for uh, broadening our collaborative opportunities and support for us, our teams in the district. So we have 343 students currently in the district um, who have IDPs, and we have 28 right now who are in the process of being assessed. So that puts our average, based on our enrollment, at 14%, which is above the statewide average. And one of the many things that this tells us is that, and this is something Dr. Rogers and I, you know, under Dr. Kemp's leadership, identified very early on, is that we need to build a more robust um, pre-referral intervention um, system at all of our sites using a multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS framework. Because if we don't have anywhere else for students to get um, targeted support, and there's and I, I do not at all mean to say that students are not getting support, there's incredible things happening, but we can do more and we can expand it. We can dial it into what's missing right now. Um, so we're excited about um, embarking on that venture. Um, and then other partners that can help us include the county office, working with our neighboring district self members, stealing some of their good ideas, bringing it in San Bruno, um, and then looking at, um, at different community agencies. We started a relationship with um, the Gate Path Family Resource Center and Parents Helping Parents, um, and they can help us strengthen our support to families within and beyond the educational setting, because we know the needs don't end when the school bell rings. The more connections we make and the more we leverage our collective talents, the better our outcomes will be across the board, hands down, or hands shaking uh, in the spirit of true partnership. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with you, and it's, it's truly been a pursuit of the heart this year, and I'm honored to be entrusted with the, um, the charge of moving the district in a more positive direction, and it's been an incredible year with an Thanks for the report. Sure. It's really great to see a special ed report in writing. Uh, the previous director didn't have anything in writing. I think it was just verbal report. So this is excellent. Um, I 
My, my main questions are around facts and data. Mm -hmm. um, in just reading this report as, as provided by staff, you provided a lot more numbers now, like percentages mm -hmm. and uh, IEPs and um, number of employees they were, were expected to hire and whatnot. That's fantastic because it's not in the report and I was forced to ask a lot of questions. Oh, sure. But, um, you know, number of open special ed positions, how many do we have in the district? Right now we have a 0.6 SLP, so speech provider. Um, so it started out as a full-time um, opening and it's been very difficult to find a full-time person. We've been able to pull someone for a day here and a day there, so we put together 0.4 of that allocation, but we still have a 0.6 open. And then we also have two open aid positions at Bel Air, um, and we're using substitutes for those. Okay, uh, thanks. My next question was, um, as far as IEPs, right? I know when I, when I was first appointed, I, I met with the special needs parents, we spoke a lot about IEPs. Mm -hmm an ability for the district to meet IEP obligations. Is there anything, it's, it's not a report, but you did mention it, thank you. Um, are we meeting the requirements as a district or are we, we have an admitted shortfall or we're trying to meet it? We, we do have an admitted shortfall because we're, we're accruing compensatory time for the service uh, provision for speech in preschool. So in that way, and the preschool students at Rollingwood do have speech services, but the students at Bel Air and then the other students who don't have a specialized program but receive related services, so 30 minutes a week of, of receiving speech, they're not getting their needs met right now. And that's something we take very seriously. And that's led us to that development of the creative solution program for the intensive language model. Typically students would just get their time kind of ticking away throughout the year in, in making it up. And we know that's not enough especially for students who are so young and just at the beginning. So we want to do a, a three hour a day program for them um, and really make sure that we're putting every resource that we have into trying to make up for the lost time. But otherwise, I think, I mean, we definitely are meeting our obligations right now, but I'll say that with the caveat that there's more we can do. There's always more we can do. There's always more that we can learn and grow and expand. And so if we're trying to do that thoughtfully, and purposefully and carefully so that it's successful. Um, you mentioned um, it's partnering with the county, partnering with other you know, large-scale entities. Um, is there grant money we could actually be seeking out as a district to actually really bolster these programs and talk about the program management aspects? It's possible. I think we have the greatest chance of accessing grant money for professional development, parent presentations. We've been able to take advantage of some of that already, and we've had some offers of people who instead give a, an incredible former SCPSD parent who said, you know what, the district did so much for my child, I want to give back, let me help you, tell me what you need. We've had so many offers like that. So we're working on seeing which resources we can tap into. There are restrictions with how we can use our money. Um, so anything that that is possible, absolutely. And, and the great news is that we're heading into the summer in a much better place than we started last summer, so it frees up some capacity to look into what haven't we thought about and exploring other options. Great, thank you.
And there are certain times and places where it's the right decision for individual families to disclose that. And if we open the parent meetings, then we are automatically disclosing disability status for everyone who's attended, because it's a group that we have invited only the special education parents. So by virtue of being there, we are saying, you're, you have a student who has special education status. And while we think that self-determination and self-advocacy and involving students in being you know, aware of their disability and, and finding ways to channel it and turn it into something that's really amazing, we're not, it's not coming from a place of shame, it's coming from a place of timing and a safe space. And we know that some families wouldn't attend if we had it as a public forum. I will say though that it's important that we offer the same resources in a broader way. So some of the ways that we've thought about working around that need and the obligation to protect confidentiality, but also recognizing that there are people who could benefit from receiving the same types of resources, we've thought about recording the presentations and just the presentations, not the audience, and potentially putting it on our website under the, the resources page or special education page. Um, we've talked about how we can engage with communities like uh, agencies like Parents Helping Parents to provide uh, professional development and, and parent education that's open to everyone. So one of the things that I really want to focus on is figuring out what would be the most beneficial presentation topics for our broader community, and how can we make sure that in protecting confidentiality and in keeping that secret, we're not keeping families who would benefit from that um, to have access to that, that information and that support. I thought in those meetings that we had when you first arrived and you planned and you're here in this auditorium, those are the meetings I was referring to. I thought you were going to have another one. We, so we're having monthly, we're calling it our parent speaker series, so we're doing monthly monthly meetings. It's um, it's different than the meeting that we had in August. And I was, yeah, I was able to get a lot of really good insight from some parent leaders on how that, the format might be more, um, more accessible for families and really figure out what it is that they needed. So, it's similar, but two point yeah. So for us, it's more of a focus on how do we 
already unlocks the potential and, and reduce as many barriers as possible, more so than participation, because participation is important. They do not, no. So, and the, and the percentage of students that take the, the Smarter Balance will vary depending on parent opt-outs throughout the year. So that is a decision that parents can make. That's a refreshing change. Um, that's not how it's always gone. I appreciate that the previous director didn't really leave much meat on the bone for you to even ask about, but that was part of the problem. Um, around this time last year, we got the best news um, we could have gotten, which was that Mr. Schwartz had resigned. Um, woefully unqualified for his position, um, his promotions and decisions destabilized a program that was already facing structural and financial challenges. Luckily, Dr. Kemp found and hired a qualified, dedicated, and patient new director. Um, director Notch walk, walked into a program with really major challenges, which were discussed in the special ed board meeting last year. Um, this year's been a lot of putting out fires, rebuilding small steps, um, to create a strong program and to build trust with staff and parents. Things aren't perfect, not at all. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Staffing remains obviously a huge challenge faced by really all special ed uh, programs in every district in California. But I think that the deck tonight and uh, uh, Director Notch's facility with answering the questions um, really shows that she has a strong direction and um, solid ideas. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with her in a number of areas and her willingness to listen and collaborate with parents and from what I've heard from many of the, the staff that I've talked to from them as well is really great um, and makes a big difference. I'll say that at the most recent parent meeting, um, it was a really, really impressive um, presentation that Sarah had obviously worked with a number of uh, staff and the stakeholders. It was on anxiety in school. 
um, and it was really engaging material. And those are the kinds of programs that I think are really helpful for the Parent Speaker Series. It's not a vent fest. Um, it's a positive experience that parents feel a, a sense of community. And that's why I think it is important to keep it a, a closed meeting to spend parents only. Um, and so I just wanted to say, uh, now that we're coming up on a year here, um, Sarah, thanks for sticking with us. Um, and I look forward to um, seeing how we progress next year. for what is a complete 180 in SBEA and CSEA's um, relationship with the SPED department. It has really been a relief um, and a much more positive um, year for us. Well, I think we both agree after lengthy conversations with both bargaining units that things are not 100% perfect. Changes by the special ed department's honesty in things that are wrong and still need to be worked on. And what we have um, accomplished together are very, um, are, are very good. Um, moving forward, um, Ms. Notch and I and Ms. Wellman have discussed extensively that Sam Bruno's lack of a competitive pay scale for both teachers and support staff, um, for a better for life word, handcuffs her department and their ability to attract and retain the qualified staff. Six hour positions, which we have approached administration about, for our support staff, for our special ed teachers in the SDC classes and learning centers are still a huge need. The support staff needs to be there as long as the kids. The teachers can't manage once our support staff leaves. It's just not possible. As evidenced later on by the warrants, you will also see still extensive payouts to special ed companies. I can name them, but thanks to Ms. Richards' very lovely sheet, I don't have to. You can just go down the thank you. It really is clear to see that we are still paying a lot of money out. Um, and if yeah, and it really does handcuff Ms. Notch in her efforts. Um, we really have tried to work together in this positive environment, but she can't fill these positions for our classified staff, which makes the teachers work even harder. So it is something we all need to work on. This is a competitive work environment, and we have to get our people in this district. We need to stand here before you and have teachers and staff that have worked with your kids, your kids, your kids for 10 years. So I can say, like Ms. Dr. Dunleavy did earlier, that's the kid I had in kindergarten. Remember when he goes to Parkside, Mr. Smith? That's what needs to happen. And the only way that can happen is if we attract and retain qualified teachers and staff. Programs at one time when I started, my sons were in these programs. We don't have that now. We have low morale, and it's unfortunate, but we need to bring it back. We have staff support staff that supports teachers, teachers that work well with us. You should use that and build on it rather than trying to bring it down like the back. Chris, Alan, uh, have done with special education this past year. 
So I, um, I just wanted to um, welcome everybody back from spring break. It's weird, it was just three days ago that we were back from spring break, but it feels like a decade. Um, <laughs> I hope everybody had a relaxing and rejuvenating time. Uh, so lots of things have happened since the last board meeting and the number of activities and we're in full throttle on planning for the 1920 school year. So on top of regular business, this makes for, for the district office very, very busy. Um, the district staff during spring break, we've worked on initial planning for professional development, building the master calendar for next year. We reviewed and identified the architect pool, which you'll hear later this evening, and tackled some much needed projects to support finishing out the school year. Before I move on to my report, I want to give a shout out to the Marita Planning Committee. Uh, this year, we had a committee get together with the city and the school district to plan for the Narita visit, which happened right before spring break. And I want to thank uh, those who led, including uh, James Stewart, the teacher at Parkside, for the successful delegation visit uh, a few weeks ago. So um, regarding uh, people outcomes, it's one of the goals for the board. Uh, lots of activities have happened over the last month, including our Big Lift Community Collaborative, which met for the second meeting uh, March the 29th. And as uh, I've mentioned before, the group is working on developing areas around early learning and preschool funding, a program alignment for pre-K through third grade and public engagement uh, around the need for early learning programs in San Bruno. So uh, this, at this last presentation, we actually had someone there to show about, to show the, the group uh, where the areas of needs are for San Bruno, and, um, and we'll be giving a presentation regarding that in, in June to the board. Also, our second session of the Forge of the Graduate was held, and the group came up to a consensus of seven skills for our graduates, and we're working on um, refining that and, and, and honing that a bit. We'll be coming back in May, and we'll link that with the board uh, in June uh, or August. Uh, I had a great opportunity to be over at Rollingwood School before spring break, and I participated in Read Across America, and I now have my favorite children's book. It's The Day the Crayons Quote. And, uh, and the kids were just so wonderful in animating voices and gestures for this book. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. And there's a video online, so you can just go to YouTube. Um, as mentioned, the special education department had their second session with the parents group. And I want to just compliment the department for their um, amazing work in um, the presentation and, and what came out of that and what Sarah said around the the need to actually take some of these on the road and, and, and sort of other families and parents in our, in our community who might be interested in this topic. Uh, I want to report that the Parkside Master Schedule work is on, is on track. Uh, as a reminder, the schedule is developed to support equity and access for all students to a full course of study. So the uh, ILT met today uh, to uh, kind of hammer out the last bit of that. Teachers have provided input and parents and students surveys were used to guide the planning. Um, some of the upcoming activities include a meeting with staff to review a preliminary schedule for next year and finalize electives and corresponding curriculum. And then the district team is going to meet with the association to review any necessary changes to the teacher contract. And finally, when this is all tied up and tied together, the student elective choice sheets will be, go home, will be going home with the students and parents Then will review the, and select their options for their electives and will return those choice sheets to the school and then we can begin to, to build the master schedule. Um, we have, on March the 15th, we had our last of our three professional development days. I want to just thank everyone who made that day possible, beginning with Valerie and Galen, who are in Ed Services. Excuse me, the maintenance team who helped us to set up the rooms, uh, Parkside who hosted us, and we had this year, for the first time, a number of district staff who are presenters. Lisa Cooper, Leslie Tu, and Donna Contreras all presented gate training to our teachers. Uh, George Ellis provided dyslexia training, and Allie Macy and Kristen Carroll, Chris Carroll, uh, did training for special education staff on handle with care. So we're very excited to begin to build a, a, a group of a cadre of teachers who can provide training to their colleagues. Uh, we are in the middle of enrollment projections for next year. We'll be finalizing those in the next two weeks. So it's very timely now that we attended three job fairs in the month of March, and we received a number of applicants for our openings. Um, the, we're going to start interviewing to fill the positions, one of which is the uh, principal openings that we have at Allen and John Muir. I went in today to look to see how many applicants we have, and we have 29 applicants for the two positions. So, um, our teacher evaluation is one of those projects that, I'm, that we're starting to work on, and I'm very excited about the committee that will be meeting on Thursday. 
uh, they sent me on a field trip up to, uh, to um, Ross Valley, and I met with their assistant superintendent, Val Valerie Whitney, uh, so we could listen to the process that they did to, uh, to uh, update their teacher evaluation instrument. Uh, the input sessions for the principal, by the way, uh, surveys close on April the 12th, and I've had input sessions with the Allen parents and the John Muir staff, and then I'll have the, um, the input sessions with the rest of the John Muir teachers and uh, the John Muir parents and the Allen teachers later this week. And we're going to be bringing a recommendation for those two principals at the May board meeting. So we intend to have them on staff uh, and assigned uh, so that uh, we can have a transition plan. We're working on that right now. It's very important that we include that. Uh, so Wendy and I attended the Schools for Safe Finance Conference in Sacramento, and this is an important conference for um, districts that are community funded. And so we learned strategies used by districts to build fund balance. And we'll talk about the um, this foot roll initiative and we're bringing back information this evening regarding that. Uh, we had uh, a, a meeting this, uh, this week with uh, the chairperson from the Budget Oversight Committee that was founded in the 2016-17 school year. We're talking about how we would relaunch that committee for next year. Uh, the Measure X Citizens Oversight Committee, when you will be giving an update on that, uh, they uh, met in March for their first meeting and organized themselves. And then at the last board meeting, I just wanted to update the board regarding the, uh, the speakers from Rolling with the requested information regarding the anticipated consolidation of the school. And there were many questions, some of which we don't have answers to at this point. And so uh, my plan is to present something to the board at the main board meeting, including some timelines and some decision making factors that we'll have to consider when it's time for the board to make that recommendation whether we're going to move forward or when we're going to move forward. Um, I'm scheduled to meet with the PTA uh, board members from Rolling Wood on April the 25th, and we'll be going back to them in May after I make the presentation to the board. Uh, last night, we had the Stratford um, meeting with the, the Elk Crystal community. They shared their preliminary plans for their, uh, for their school, and, uh, and they had the neighborhood meeting. There were 16 people in attendance, and the CEO from Stratford was there. Uh, and listen to the community and our input from them regarding the site plan. They had a, a large team of about six or seven people in attendance. Uh, school safety is always one of our concern. Uh, the North County superintendents and police chiefs held a meeting in March and uh, districts are sharing more of their progress around the implementation of the Big Five and their plans to increase site safety and security. And one of the outcomes of this meeting was a desire among the cities to launch a, launch a joint SRO, middle school and high school principal group that would get together periodically to talk about campus safety and strategies that they're using. So the first meeting will be on uh, April the uh, not April, excuse me, August the 2nd. And um, we're excited to be a part of that group. Our employee appreciation event is scheduled for May 2nd. And this year we're gonna start off with a team building activity called the Amazing Race. So our schools, uh, our schools are, we hope our schools will have a team that enters that. And I want to thank the committee and the donors for helping with this. Um, one other thing is that it's been part of my community engagement is, is Rotary. And um, this was a busy month for Rotary. As the uh, president of the nominee, I attended two major Rotary functions uh, with the district 5150. And um, they are uh, around grant making for the Rotary and um, just training for the uh, for the role that I'll step into next year on July 1st. So I want to thank the board for uh, your support. So the principal is, is sharing the proposed schedule with the staff, and I don't want to get ahead of him and the staff on this. Uh, so once he's shared that presentation with the staff and has feedback, then I'll come back and give the board. But that is one of the things that they're looking at, because the challenge we have is that uh, with a six-period schedule is that a student who is a special education student or an English learner does not have access to an elective. And part of the middle school model is that they get access to an elective, and so uh, the, the school had to come up with a presentation of how they would go about doing that, and so the second period is one of the models that they're looking at.
can, but I'd like for the principal to have the opportunity to share that with, uh, with uh, his colleagues and get their feedback before I uh, firmly say which model we're going to go with. So are, are they reinventing the wheel or are they reaching out to other districts who have already done that? I mean, our high school district did, high school district did that years ago for that reason alone. So, so they've been studying this since September. So when the, when the, when the principal was hired, that was one of the first things I talked to him about was this inequity and opportunity for students to have required courses and then have an opportunity for electives. So the school has attended uh, various conferences, including the Middle School Week Conference, and have attended also master schedule training to get, and then been out to visit different schools, like during the Christmas holidays, the principal went to visit some schools that were soon session, look at their schedules and talk with the principals at those schools to get some idea of what are those types of schedules that they have in place. And we have, you know, the thing about um, master scheduling in any, in any, in particularly in a middle school, because you have a combination of teachers with multiple subject credentials and teachers with single subject credentials. Where in high school you have all single subject credential teachers. So you have to take a look at who's on staff and what their credentialing are, and kind of play around with developing your schedule around that, because there are rules around the students that a multiple subject teacher can serve versus a single subject teacher. So it's it's kind of a complicated system, but uh, in the end, I, I've seen the draft, and I am very pleased with the draft proposal that they put together. Good evening, President Martinez, trustees. As always, things are moving very fast as we approach the end of the school year. I think one thing that you guys have heard from all of our staff reports is the level of collaboration. So there's a lot of things that we all mention in our staff reports because we all work collectively with one another. So there might be something that Dr. Camp or um, Mrs. Notch or Ms. Richard mentioned that is not in my report, but we are all working together. Um, our middle school social studies adoption committee has just completed their curriculum pilot and our elementary uh, schools are wrapping up their pilot in the next few weeks. Next week, the sites will begin inventorying their curricular materials so that we can place our orders well in advance before the end of the month. Uh, last month, our teachers and staff participated in a full day of professional development. The topics for the trainings um, included assessment at the early education level, differentiated instruction and meeting student needs, integration of language development at the middle school and articulation from middle school and high school. The trainings were well attended and we received some good feedback. We have finished 99.999% of our LPAC submitted testing. This is amazing compared to where we were last year. I'm um, so proud of the team that we have put together. Um, we have, I think it's six students that still need to, to complete makeup testing. Our physical fitness screening is almost complete as well, and we're beginning task testing for grades three through eight. Our testing window opens on May 16th and concludes on May 21st. So we also want to make sure with attendance that our kiddos are here every day and on time all day um, and putting that home at the school sites. Our special education department has been working diligently to ensure that students have the appropriate supports to successfully access the test and take the correct test. All principals have participated in training and have trained their staff in the testing procedures and in administering the exam. We have been working closely with IT services to ensure that all devices are working and we will be running um, a test run of our system to ensure that we have appropriate bandwidth later this week. Business services, special education, and ed services have begun to work on um, with the county to conduct our annual update of our LCAP. We will be meeting with our LCAP advisory committee again later this month on April 30th. At that time, we'll obtain some more feedback on the proposed metrics for the actions and services. Summer school preparation is well underway. Our enrollment for um, Big Lift Summer School, Elevate Math, Seal Summer Bridge, and ex Extended School Year are now open. Positions for Elevate Math and Seal um, have all been filled. We'll be conducting interviews for the remaining positions within the next couple of weeks. 
We have six SEAL teachers who will be participating in the Summer Bridge program. This is where they'll co-teach with a partner teacher um, in order to practice the skills that they've learned throughout their first year of training and provide each other with support and feedback. Next month, our SEAL summer, teach summer school teachers will begin their planning of the unit for summer school. Um, and our elevated math teachers have already begun their training uh, with the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. This coming Saturday, Dr. Katz will be leading uh, the students in the Gate Academy um, in writing their scientific abstracts for their STEM fair projects. The first annual STEM fair will be held on Saturday, May 4th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Parkside Intermediate. Um, students will showcase their projects between 9 and 11 and will be followed by awards. Uh, Dr. Kemp already addresses, but we've spent the last week planning, organizing, um, so that we can have a successful implementation of our professional learning curriculum, instruction, and assessment programs for the 2019-2020 school year. Thank you for listening to my report.
just got the information. And what I'm really excited about is that the preliminary audit was done this week. The auditors have been in our office and, and um, addressing office managers and payroll and personnel and anybody else that would listen to them. Um, and while it's very early, the items that were reviewed, attendance, instructional minutes, ASB, the Associated Student Body um, uh, uh, Account, and some review of the personnel and the payroll records. And we were found all in compliance in those areas. Um, we were able to tick off some of the things that we had audit findings last year. We will not be having those audit findings this year. So it's, uh, they were very appreciative of us and said that they could truly see that there was a big difference um, and that things were changing to the betterment and we weren't going to be having as many findings as we have in the prior years. It's still not 100% as we're still cleaning up and making sure everything is done correctly, accurately, timely, etc. But we are getting there now.
and pertinent portions of the Government Code Sections 5422 uh, for the uses specified herein. If there are any offers or directions, uh, please refer to the Superintendent of San Mateo Union High School District on Delaware Avenue in San Mateo. Uh, all offers must be received by the district within 60 days of receipt of this notice. We received the notice on April the 12th. Excuse me, April the 1st.
I appreciate that Mary first bringing that up because that's been a problem um, for many years in the district and in the past the board has voted on moving some of the issues forward when they know there's a lot of public um, attendance for that issue. I noticed that hasn't been happening, so that's a great thing to bring up. Um, I'm here as a teacher at, from Parkside. I teach math and science. Um, the, we currently do not have a science book or curriculum. When I became a science teacher for Parkside last year, I was not only promised NGSS training, I was also promised that we are working on getting some sort of curriculum, like a book. Um, unfortunately, that's not happened. I haven't heard of any plans other than the science teachers taking it upon themselves to reach out and try to get some sort of um, pilot going at our school. We're pretty desperate for curriculum. Um, and then when you don't have a science book and you're told to stop making copies because we're cut off with paper, it makes our jobs really hard. Um, I hope that the board has heard our need for paper. Uh, this is not the first year that this has happened. It also happened last year, and all of the other years I've ever worked here, this is my 15th year here. Um, we always seem to be told to stop using paper. Um, again, without a curriculum, it's pretty hard to stop using paper. Uh, another big problem is materials. We are very low on materials, especially in the Title I schools I've been talking to other teachers. I don't understand why we're desperate for supplies and that we have to go out and get GoFundMe to get supplies when I'm seeing money spent in other places um, in the district. Uh, limiting our children and the supplies that they need uh, is, is something that I think needs attention. Uh, thanks. Second. Is there any um, question or comments on 
as tax is concerned throughout the year. Um, but at the end of the year, from June 30th, they must have a positive uh, cash balance, not a fund balance, but a cash balance. And so this uh, uh, fund, temporary fund transfer is in case we've, uh, the resolution is for fund default to receive funds, um, in case their cash balance is a negative, or it looks like it will be a negative for June 30th. We, we did this last year. Um, I'm happy to say that we have done a, a better job of monitoring and uh, presenting timely invoices that have been getting paid more timely. So therefore, uh, we probably had a negative cash flow at that time, but it's going to be much greater, much less than it was last year. So that's why we've had it, uh, a resolution of up to 250000 um, when I checked the cash balance, uh, I think it was just before the, the form packet went out last week, uh, the balance, the cash for our fund club was only at a negative 22,000, which is so much better than it has been because it has been up there towards uh, a negative 500,000. So we've done a good job of monitoring it and getting it under control. Second. I ask these questions of staff, and thank you for your response, but I just want to ask them to the public. Um, is the board being asked to draw on restricted assets to make this transfer? No, what it's being asked to do is to draw on unrestricted um, funds to give to restricted funds because Fund 12 is a restricted program. Okay. Um, is this a common practice for, for districts to do? Yes, it is. Every year, starting about now, because uh, um, it has to be like a, uh, around 120 days, that you need to put the resolution in and get approved by the board. It is very common. All the districts will be looking at all of their funds, and they will um, do a cash flow and determine if those funds are going to be um, positive fund balance, or excuse me, positive cash balances at June 30th. It is a very common practice. We are not the only one that does this. What would you say on average is the, the percentage across the county? I, I honestly, I don't know what to tell you on that. Okay. Each different, uh, district is very different, and they could be all doing it for different reasons. Thanks again for your questions. Second that. Okay, any other uh, questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Seconds by passes by vote. Okay, okay so I have item four selection of the full qualified architects for measure X projects pursuant to the product. management team and the um, project manager, we did go out and have an RFQP for architects. And 
they were to submit a proposal. I was believe it was by March. I can't remember the date, but uh, in, it was in March that they were to uh, present a proposal. So February eighteenth. Okay, sorry, February eighteenth. It's been a long process, and, and I've forgotten the dates. Anyway, so we got. 12 firms giving us proposals, and we've got the list of them there in the board agenda. And after <clears throat> a team got together, it happened to be Dr. Kemp, myself, and um, the CEO from Millbury, uh, Rick Champion, all came together and we went through the proposals and we ranked them and made them, and we came down, and you can see the, the type of um, criteria we used in order to um, determine what would be best for the district. We, after we rated them, all those 12, we brought them down to six uh, architect firms that we wanted to look at a little more closely. Um, so we had interviews with those six, and from those six, we determined the three that are listed are the ones that we believe would be best suit the needs of the district. And those would be um, Hipster, Yemen, Yemen, uh, I cannot remember, HYA. That's, that's how they're, um, they're going. Um, Artic and Drawing Torrens Architect or DTA. So those three are the ones that we are bringing forward for the board to approve as a pool of architects. It, we are not um, asking to have the board approve the architect for the Allen project, which is the first project in our bond, uh, Measure X, um, that will be at a, another date, um, because we will take these three, if approved by the board, we will have, um, have them bring forward a presentation, and we will select from that presentation the one that we would want to have for the actual Allen project. But this evening, we have narrowed it down to three for our pool, which means that we can, any of the projects that we are going to be having, we can change those architects out of those three and say we want that one to do this project, this one to this, this project, or um, one person to do it all. But at this particular point in time, what we're asking the board to do is approve the, the pool of the three. I'll second that. I have a question. Um, as far as um, I noticed with the way the resolution is written, this actually says no financial impact. It says no fiscal impact. We go to the very Thank you. This process identifies all the dark is, is talking about that this decision has no fiscal impact. Right? This decision of creating the pool of architects does not have a financial impact. Gotcha. When we actually um, bring forward the architect, yes, it will have yes. a, a fiscal impact. Okay, thank you. For the chair, I have a question regarding um, uh, project labor agreements. Um, when are we going to be looking at any of the Moving forward with the PLA. We don't usually have to. about the, in terms of future items? Well, like I know that. So, so, so if we're going to be moving forward with uh, entering with the project labor agreement with our union leaders, um, that usually happens after, the, after we uh, chose the construction management group. But I don't know that we should be looking at. We're, we're not far enough along in the in the programming yet to bring that to the board. Uh, we will have uh, an update in uh, May on May the eighth. We'll include that item in the update. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you.
So we're asking the board this evening to um, for a uh, consideration for adding two board meetings to the 2018-2019 school year. That would be one meeting on April the 24th and a second meeting on May the 22nd. And then we're asking the board to uh, adjust the calendar for 2019-20, which was approved in December, to move the April board meeting out of spring break week <laughs> to April the 15th. I know it's tax day. Twenty four is gonna to be tough for me to make. Just FYI. You guys can have the meeting fine by me, but just let me know. I have a concern with the fact that he may not be here only because is this because we can't speak about our closed session item in regards to negotiating with the superintendent because for the community to know, according to BP twenty one twenty one that was brought forth to our attention at the last um, special meeting, we as a board cannot have such, um, we cannot have that topic for uh, a schedule for a schedule for a special meeting. Those topics in regards to salaries, how they schedules and all that regarding that's in the board policy 2121, I would read, but it's kind of long. Um, we can't have them, so, I, so is that the reason why we're scheduling extra Meaning, because if that's the case, I don't see why we just can't keep having those discussions um, legally posted and agendized on at regular meetings. And the fact that Andy may not be able to join the board concerns me because this is a topic that the whole board needs to be present. So I would like just to continue to have that item agendized at regular meetings and not add extra means the L cap and all that, that's me we just keep it at that, but I think we need to keep it at the regular board meetings. To the chair, I have a question. Um, I thought the, date, the dates in red seem to be the added meetings on the left, so we're actually adding three meetings. Is that correct? April 24th, May 22nd, and June, June 26th? June 26th was previously scheduled for oh. two meetings in the month of June. I see. We, we had we had planned to do board study sessions in April and May, and so the request was instead of doing a special meeting, to do a regular meeting. Oh, I understand. Okay, so it's already scheduled. It just changed to regular meeting. Thank you for that clarification. And so, um, can you please answer my question? So, is that the reason why we're adding? That's a, that is one reason. It gives the board flexibility to realize the money. Okay, so the fact that we're not so I'm hoping that we're not going to be seeing that topic at those schedules at those meetings scheduled. Right, it's going to be so that, that. So I'm assuming that the topics we had here tonight under closed session that states it's item A2 conference with a paper negotiator, agency negotiating board president, underrepresented employees, superintendent. So this will not go on April 24th and 22nd. That's I'm assuming. Not okay, then so, so that's the reason why we're having these regular meetings, right? I'm not, I'm not saying whether they will or wouldn't. So, so if I see them there, then that's the reason why we Okay, thank you. So, Trustee Mason, you, you mentioned that you're not, you're not sure if you'd be able to attend. Yes, but I'm okay with, with what's being proposed here tonight. But Andy, that topic's there. You need to okay. Hi. Dr. Sanchez? Hi. Mr. Mason? Hi. 
I'm sorry, Kevin, since um, Adriana told us something, can we have her inter uh, introduce the topic? Because I'm, I'm not sure if you're well versed in this. And for sake of yeah. time, Andrew, you can just come up and speak on the item, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, this, there was a community request to do this. Um, I think we have um, the opportunity to discuss this, um, this item uh, as it's been presented. So when you're looking, trying to do an uh, analysis of, of this, um, put together uh, some information on, on um, the particular measure here and where it stands in terms of um, things that the board has its own authority to do. And some other things, even some uh, factual basis for what's being presented within the sample. Starting with uh, the second I think, highlighted one, there's uh, midway through it says, whereas USC has identified that 80% of the revenue will come from just 8% of large properties, 
owned by corporations and wealthy investors. Many of them have a stake. That's um, an item that, we, that the board would have no information on. It has nothing to do with schools. Um, further, going down to the next item, where USC research shows that a majority of commercial owners already pay close up to market value, making the current system inequitable among businesses and benefiting large owners who have held land for a long period of time. That also has nothing to do with school boards. It's not in the purview of the board to weigh in on that. Wouldn't factor into the board's decision in any way. Uh, furthermore, it says, whereas the failure to close the commercial property loophole has led to poor land use and inflated land values, particularly limiting the ability to provide adequate high density housing and land use. That again is not the school board, it's the business between. We can't weigh into it, we can't. It's not for us to say what um, the state of land use or any of that is outside of, of our um, jurisdiction and purview. Later on it says, whereas the act also provided billions of, in funding yearly for cities, counties, and special districts, um, and locally controlled revenues for parks, public safety, housing, infrastructure, health, human services, libraries, and the environment, again, schools are not referenced at all in that declaration. I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin, for sake of the time. <coughs> so what are you saying is you don't want us to support this? What I'm saying is that this... Um, Just yes or no, Kevin, please. Yes. Okay, okay, so okay, let's make this quick, please, because uh, you're killing me. Okay. So, so if and when this passes, are you going to tell us the board to not accept the money that's going to come to the district? That has nothing to do with it. Okay. Okay, so, so this also goes uh, to another um, topic from this is that it actually has some um, elements in it with, which are misleading, and I think it's important for us to know that as well. Um, it says that the, the measure will provide uh, $4.5 billion annually to schools, whereas the Attorney General um, has seen that that is not the case. Um, it, it promises uh, within a year. The, um, the, 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 this would bring $11.4 billion in property taxes to cities. Yet the Attorney General says that the, um, the total of the is uh, no greater than $6.5 to $10.5 billion. So I think in total, what I'm recommending is not a question of passing it or not passing it. And not a question either of being in favor of the measure once it comes to or not, um, board members can do that just like anybody else. But I think we have to be very careful in um, items like this that um, they're carefully vetted and that the board is actually taking a position um, with a full set of facts. Mo typically, resolutions like this do um, come to school districts to agencies that we're members of, which includes CSBA, um, ACSA, the Association of School Administrators, as of the California Association of School Business Officials, School Services, and others. Um, when that happens, um, the care is taken to show that only those things that relate to schools and our children are the things that come for us. Well, are you aware that PT, that California State PT has a first authority? Can I for the chair? Can I ask a question? Sure. So we can thank you for. President uh, Martinez for giving its credit in, in looking into this. I think what we need is legal counsel to say, one, this is a fantastic resolution that, and the board can vote on it in this uh, spectrum or not. So I think that um, the discussion of this, there's a huge value in adopting this. I totally, totally support it. But without understanding what other districts do, right. what are the districts across the county who adopted it? in a legal sense, what the ultimate benefit is to our kids and programs. I'm all for something like this, but I also want, to, I want legal counsel to weigh in what's our role as a board in talking about this. Do the chair, what would have been, I think, the right thing for us to do is we could have reached out to the gentleman 
that Adriana Shea had provided us for us to reach out to him. I just don't know why Kevin, why you didn't invite him to come to the meeting tonight. The distribution as well. There are elementary school districts who are endorsing this. Um, thank you for doing your level of research. I would appreciate you probably doing that in other cases where you get and you really should do, but thank you. But still, I think we could have invited that gentleman to come and speak tonight, but you didn't invite him. So um, I think we should table this to the next meeting because we still have time to um, adopt this resolution, should the case need be, and invite him, and maybe also perhaps invite our legal counsel, and... Um, the point for this is that, that this kind of resolution is not a crime. This is the kind of thing that is a waste of okay. resources to go to legal counsel in the sense that... Okay, then we'll this invite... Is if we want to have everything that we're asked to advocate, go to the attorneys first, it's, we'll have an unprecedented level of attorney engagement. This is, what it's saying here, what, a res, what any resolution does, it says that based on this set of facts leads to the board to come to this conclusion. It's, you can like it, you can vote for it, but if that set of facts doesn't lead to that conclusion, that's for us to decide. I, I, so through the chair, I have a question to make. I mean, a question to make, a question to pose. Um, it seems like we have a lot of documents here. I, I think some of it might be factual, some of it might be opinion. So I think it's good for us to, to look through all of it, take, take a little bit of time. And then I think my question is, um, I think you mentioned that it's not in the board's um, purview to, to recommend To recommend something, it's like, it's not okay. So I was just wondering, because I, I know that several school districts are supportive of this, and I think one of them is San Francisco Unified School District. So in order for San Francisco Unified School District to, to be in favor of this, did their, did their board have to approve that, or, or did it, was it just the, the district staff that, that made that statement that the school district is in favor of it? I was just, just wondering from a this would logistical be, point. This would be their board. So their board approved, their board approved. Yeah. Okay. It, goes, it goes through their board. So it was, in, it was in their board's purview, but not in our. Well, it's, it's saying, you know, no, I'm just asking a question. Is in our, in our, okay. For like you would, you know, you can, um, we would weigh in on, on a matter that's not related to our students. I understand. Well, it is related to the district's funding, though. So I was just wondering, what, why did Sam, in your opinion, why did Sam's Sweet Red School District? Um, and, and, and other school districts are approving this. Other school districts are saying ETA is as a, as a, as a well, What I'm saying is that the ETA may look at things that matter to them, but we have the responsibility to look at and only at those things that are within the purview of the school district. That's what the leader is for. The state PTA advocates on behalf of all students in the state of California in regards to public education. So I think that, you know, well, personally, I wasn't interested because it's hundreds of dollars for each EL student. Well, it's anticipated or estimated that you that we receive hundreds of dollars for every English language learner student. But I'm not sure if that's factual, if that's opinion. So that's why it would be nice. So that's to that's what I'm saying. So we yeah. we need to right. we don't know the impact to, to our school district. What this does would be asking the school district itself to endorse this, and we're doing it from uh, a set of Misleading representations. For the chair, I think, I think we could actually make a resolution and say ask staff to bring back a no. subject matter expert on this. Staff can make resolutions to ask staff. Is it possible yeah. for us? Well, I, I, I think it's a common comment for this. Actually, I mean, it's yeah. not actually a discussion. Well, we could get a guest speaker that could come and speak really intelligently and objectively about this information, right. and then we could come to a board decision. Correct.
for the chair. Thanks again, Dr. Sanchez, for providing the, the end 2020. Got it. But that puts a little timeline for us, right? So we could go back and say, there's something we don't want to fall off the page. We don't want to lose sight of this if there is an opportunity here. Correct? Yes. We not, can, I agree. It's not a question of losing opportunity, but there has to be a little bit more work to be done before a resolution is happening. I, I agree. Yeah. So, so can we, yeah. let's, let's table it for the next month's meeting. I think on the comment, we'll have, yeah. Yeah. we will have, we'll invite, we can direct the board president to invite, and is it Greek? Is that the same? Um, the gentleman who's uh, overseeing this here in our community and have him come and speak more on this. So I'd just like to table this to the next month's meeting. So that we can all ask, ask him a question. Okay, just give another time to ask friends. Um, first, First, thank you for putting it on the agenda within one month of me asking. I really do appreciate that. Um, there have been several school districts that have endorsed this act. Alameda Unified School District, Albany Unified School District, Berkeley Unified School District, El Rancho Unified School District, Emory Unified School District, Oakland Unified School District, Pasadena Unified School District, San Francisco Unified School District, Los Angeles Unified School District, West Contra Costa Unified School District, Jefferson Union High, Union High School District. Um, I understand the point that these are larger districts, but it's clearly in their purview and they are school districts, so I think it's warranting further discussion. Ben would be happy to come in and discuss it. For the public, I would just like to reiterate what the crux of this act is. Um, the crux of the school and community's first act is simple. There is a major loophole in Prop 13 that is allowing large corporations and commercial property owners to get away with not paying their fair share in taxes. Prop 13 was passed in 1978 as a way to help homeowners, but this loophole has increased the overall tax burden on individuals and decimated funding for our schools and public services. The Schools and Communities First Act will close the corporate loophole on Prop 13. This common sense reform will generate $11 billion a year for our schools and public services while maintaining protections for all residential property owners and small business owners. For the last four decades, commercial property owners have saved billions of dollars while the tax burden on homeowners has vastly increased. Chevron alone is pocketing over $100 million a year because they are still paying property taxes based on what their land was worth in the 1970s. Now more than ever, this must change. Um, I'm not gonna read the rest of this, but 40% of 11 billion is significant and $800 per unduplicated child is significant for a school district that has a lot of unduplicated children. Anyone know the number of unduplicated head you in that? Um, but clearly there's more discussion to be had. I'm not a subject matter expert. I'm going to tell you the Attorney General is not saying that they can make $11 million, $11 million. There's others that are saying that they are. The Attorney and General of the State of California says that it will not generate $10 million. There's estimates that are higher. And there's no suicide alert. Again. And we're a government agency, so we, we go to the student sources. Okay. Our, our, would, you, would you contradict what the Attorney General has been saying and analyze the office of it? Given our current Attorney General, that's US is questionable, but I understand your point. I understand your point. And I think that it does, you, are you saying you don't want to discuss this with somebody other than the presentation that you saw for a group that? Has specific concerns about the act. What I'm saying is the, the resolution, there's a lot about this resolution, right? But it's, it's not set for a school board to, to address. But there are 10 plus that have addressed it. But still, that's. Sounds like a no brainer. I would say that there are things in here that don't belong in a school board resolution. For the chair. For the chair, that's where I think we need legal counsel. Because yeah. it's Absolutely. Absolutely. Legal counsel. Counsel. I think it's worth every penny. Well, through the chair, let's, let's, let's admission.
she finish her sure, that's comment? Because I think there's no, somebody who has comment. I wanted to bring this to everybody's attention because we would benefit as a school district from this. And as a school district that is suffering financially yeah. and talking about teacher compensation and not having textbooks or paper yeah. for science programs Thank to you. have 800 extra dollars potentially, maybe it's different, 40% of 6 billion, if it's half of the 11 billion, is significant. It is significant for a school district that can't pass a parcel tax that desperately needs it to pay our teachers. I mean, I could go on and on. We have clear financial problems. It is worth investigating. I'm saying this all the others should have the opportunity. Can't hear you. Before the school district will be an endorsement, it will have to be factual. funding formula. So it's equitable and that's perhaps a concern of some people. Policy committee met uh, last week and reviewed uh, the policies. There was a policy that was identified that was related to the inner district uh, attendance that there were some errors that we should have crossed out. We made those corrections and uploaded the corrected revised policies to the packet. So starting with the first policy on the charter school oversight. We don't have any charter schools in the school district, but this is part of the policy manual. Board policy 0420.41 and exhibit. The next one was on is board policy 13.12. Point three, uniform complaint procedures. These are updated regarding the uh, federal anti-discrimination. So there were a number of items that had to be fixed within the language there in UCP. Next one is uh, administrative regulations and exhibits related to 1312.4, which is Williams complaints procedures. Update because of ed code changes and around preschool programming and the forms. An update to AR 1340 regarding access to public records. Language was cleaned up there. And uh, information related to evaluation modification of district plans that was taken out but was included in another item. Board policy 3100 
on business and non-instructional matters related to budget adoption, and it just uh, brings up language, talks about public meetings. And then there was administrative regulation related to that matter. There was board policy update 3260 related to fees and charges. We don't charge students for school. And we also, uh, so that was updated also related to collection of debt. And administrative regulation for that one. Including loss of damaged property. Um, there was administrative regulation 35.15.4. Uh, that was the same uh, loss or damaged property. It's currently in our book board manual. Uh, non discrimination of employment for board policy 4030. There was updates regarding immigration status for employment. Um, and then the um, Updated. There's an administrative regulation that goes along with that. Personal illness and injury leave, uh, 4161 and 4361 and 4261. So related to the different class of employees. And so that uh, just clarified language updates from Ed Code. And uh, leave for military and um, employees. And we had uh, board policy 51. 17, which was regarding the inter-district attendance, updates there on agreements and permits. For the chair, can you explain a little bit about option one and the reason why we, we chose that as an option for the inter-district assistant attendance? So there's two, there's two options. So there's the option one is regarding inter-district attendance agreements and permits, which mm -hmm. means we have an agreement with uh, other school districts Greater district attendance, and then the other one is basically making ourselves a district of choice, and that's not that's not a, an option for us as a school district because we're a community funded school district. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Through so the chair, I just wanted to comment that um, we, we actually reviewed about 100 pages, and uh, it was pretty straightforward. But I wanted to comment that CSBA, which is the California School Board Association, does a wonderful job recommending and updating these portals. It's really that's why it's all highlighted in yellow. Just so that it's And then we had an uh, administrative regulation update 5125.2, which was regarding withhold, withholding grades, diplomas, or transcripts. We don't issue diplomas, so that wasn't pertinent to that. We, that's just an update uh, on, how, on when, and, when and how you can do that. Um, and then we took out uh, policy, which was not in our handbook, but was in the update, 5127, graduation ceremonies, so we don't have that. Exhibit 5145.6 was updated to reflect the new regulations that we've been uh, updating all year long. It's for our parent handbook when we notify parents on parent notifications. Uh, child development, uh, 5148. It's around licensing and the changes in the laws around licensing for preschool programs. And then there was a 9323.2, um, which was um, regarding action of the board. And so it outlines that, um, just cleaned up language, and then and removed some language from the policy. And then there was an exhibit that went with it. And it explains uh, the different kind of actions of when you need to have a super majority vote and when you can just go with the majority vote. So they just cleaned up language there and removed some outdated language.
Case K5, classified personnel report. If I could pull that in as well. Second. And 14. I'll second that. Supervisor, oh, um, you might scrolling down. Is someone scrolling? It's it's at the top of the offer of employment. Okay. Oh, there. Uh, I need to better understand. I need the board needs to better understand what step five means and what are the basic requirements that makes makes it step five. So just to, just to recap, when we, uh, was it February we approved the position, correct? January 31st, 2018. Fantastic, it was an exciting meeting. Um, so basically, based on that, you hire somebody in step four within six months and they're qualified, they're automatically moved to step five as a consent item, correct? No. It doesn't come back to consent, that's... Okay. Consultant, correct? At that time, he was hired as an employee. 
then there was complications, and we could not hire him then as the employee. Right. But we had okay. we had in the minutes that he was an employee. So, so I would like to propose that we do not entertain this at this time at step five. I'd like to propose that we that he um, is either step one or step two, due to the fact that he's been here for a year. Okay, then I think the then maybe then, then, I'm, then I'm, I don't think that we can vote on this tonight then. Because I don't agree with it. Not, we, have to, we have to not approve this whole um, consent item. Well, to the chair, how many, I don't know, I just have a question. How many, how many steps would there be for this position? So step 20, is there step 10? There's only step five. And then it oh, so this is the final step, yes. <laughs> Even so, that's not the board. It's only been here. Yeah, it was just a question, I'm sorry. It's, it's only been here a year. However, it's based on years of experience in I, I, that particular. I understand that, but because of the situation, he couldn't be hired as an, as an employee of the district. He was hired as a consultant. We should be brought back to because everyone you know starting in the district. I, I, I'd be, I would agree to step one or step two. I think we have to essentially hear that uh, the role he would be to ask questions about where the work or not managing the district. Once the questions are But, but Kevin, but we, either, we can't, if we don't agree with the step that's being recommended, we can't approve the whole because you can't separate. But you can't, the board doesn't put people on. We don't hire people into, we, only, we have. But we are hiring him because it's coming before the board to approve this. So yes, we are hiring him. Okay, but what I'm saying is that we will consider the report once the questions have been asked. Questions, questions have been asked and the concerns have been raised. I don't think the board should approve this at this time. Okay, I understand that. Do we have a motion? Yes, through the chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve item five. Classified personal reports. Is there a second? Second. to determine whether or not we're going to place an employee on this. 
if the board would like to bring this back for further discussion at a later time with me, uh, perhaps during the superintendent evaluation, we could talk about that. But the matter is, this evening, the question before the board is, do you approve classified personnel report that's presented as is? based on their experience, just as when we hire teachers, we give up to 10 years credit for a teacher. When we hire principals, we give credit for their experience. As a principal, we don't put everybody on step one. That is not what happens in any public school district. And so with, even with management employees, we look at prior years of experience. Mr. Daly brings many years of experience as a maintenance operations transportation supervisor. Uh, in, in a private school setting prior to coming to our school district. So the decision to play, where to place an employee on the salary schedule is, is done through, uh, through looking at their prior year's experience. And he was initially placed on step four when he came to the school district. He now has 16 months additional experience. Ms. Wong, CSE president, and I are both highly concerned with the district's hiring administrators at higher steps than as on the administrative pay scales, even though, according to Ms. Richard, we are continuing to deficit spend. And even though, later on, the board will be considering approving the Ed Code waiver again, which states the opposite, that we are having financial hardship, but yet we were able to hire administrators at higher than the posted salary, or higher steps. If teachers, as staff explained, or administration explains, if teachers or staff came from another district, came from Millbury, came from San Francisco, and came into the district, we would be granted those years of service. That is true, and credited that time we are simply requesting that the board hold the administration to the very same standards. So if they're coming from Burlingame Unified School District or with that many years, the same standards that we are held accountable to.
Once again, the board is requesting a waiver. Are we not on board? I'm on the waiver for the, sorry, Kevin. Sorry, Mr. Martinez, I'm not on board. K8. No, so the K61 was probably K5. Impact for $14,000. This is on the list of warrants as the credit card payments for the month of February. The exact wording from the document is Cal card credit card payments $14,500.69. For the month of February, payments include food for board meetings, job fair fees, San Mateo CSBA event, coalition for adequate housing or cash. Po uh, posting for the RFQs and P's, Department of Industrial Relations Convenience Fee, um, Shred Fees, CS, CAS, MEC, Conference for the Music Teachers, including Registration and Lodging, Workshop for Parkside Admin, including Registration and Lodging, Workshop for Financial Analyst, California Toxic EPA Fee, Superintendent Travel to Access. Conference including registration and lodging, maintenance supplies, educational services travel for the GATE program, Illuminate Conference for the technology including registration and lodging, technology supplies, and special education supplies. Thank you. Was there any additional words? No, uh, staff was able to answer all of my questions over email, so I, I'm fine. Thank you. requesting again to have the copy of the credit card statement okay. and, the, um, in the, and the board agenda. Um, I remember um, Wendy did say at one meeting that she was going to start including it um, <coughs> if I stopped asking. So I didn't expect to keep asking, but it's still not there. So um, I'd like to know, Wendy, how come it's not in here? There's no consensus on the board to do board. that. Okay, well, do you, I, I think that we need board consensus when a board member requires for inform, extra information in the Because it is available to you. Is it because you don't think that it should be in there as well? No, I don't know. Okay. Okay, board consensus. Do we need to take board consensus now? For the chair, I, I think this itemization is sufficient. Uh, but it doesn't I, have it doesn't have everything itemized with the amount. Um, uh, I, was, I ask a lot of questions, I'll be honest. But I do want to respect staff's time and effort you put into the warrant, so I want to acknowledge it. It's only two pages. And it's not even about, it's not even okay. for you or for me. It's for the community. We're going to be practicing transparency and open honest communication, especially when it comes to our finances. I'll say, I said it before, and I'm going to continue to say, uh, Kevin, that um, it's not going to it's not, it's take, it's take much of staff. It's only two pages. I don't know if you've ever gone to see it. I have. 
It's only two pages now. If the community wants to dig deeper and find out to see the, just, the, the documentation that justifies for every expenditure, once they see it in the board packet, then that's their prerogative. But as long as we present it to the community and include this information in our board packet, I don't see what the problem is. I don't know why there's hesitation um, from our staff, from you. Um, it's all about being transparent and presenting to the community. So I'm going to ask again, and I'll keep on asking Kevin, this information needs to be, and uh, yeah, this is okay, this is all right, but bare minimum, but if, you know, I don't know, it's the CSBA event, how much was that? I, and I, you know, I don't think that I, do. I as a board member, have to or should have to go into the district office to see, hey, Wendy, can you show me this? It would be right there in my face. Now, if I want to see backup information, and if I want to do that, that's my right to, to do so. But I think that this information should just be laid out in the community. Okay, thank you. You've made your point. Well, no, you're asking for consensus. I, 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 I don't know. I just think we should fill it out. I, I think we should so, have Through the chair, I have a comment to make. So if we could take a step back and look at the big picture, we, I think our budget is roughly, would you say, 30 to $31 million a year? So I don't want to prorate staff over a $10,000 a month charge. However, I do I do want to mention that uh, it was the January meeting, I believe, when uh, Ms. Richards said that she would put it in the board packet, whether it was just to the board through communications uh, from Dr. Kemp so that it wasn't attached to the board packet, or I'm not sure how logistically it was going to be uh, distributed, but, but I do remember um, staff saying that they were going to provide. So I think that's what needs to be addressed as to why it was, and I think that's why there was not board consensus, because we thought we were done with that conversation. Otherwise, uh, it, otherwise it might have carried on to the conversation. And to be honest, I do also want to say, to take a step back, we have a $30 million budget, and we don't want to narrow, we don't want to have staff spend a lot of time on $10,000. Okay. It's not, it's two pages. Three, three pages the most. So that's the nice thing. What Wendy simply said was Okay, you okay. you've made your point. I'm, I'm, I'm having a conversation with Terry. Yeah, and now she's made her point. So, so will I see it when the other next month's meeting? Uh, unless the board. Well, who said we need consensus? I don't think we need consensus. Who said it? Yes. You do? We do need to. It's not a for discussion. Okay, so next, okay, so Stella's, this is not agenda. And uh, Kevin and Stella, please agendize it for next month's meeting. Because I'm so tired of asking for the same thing over and over again. This is ridiculous. No, no, Kevin. No, because if I was board president and if you wanted this information, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have this hesitation. I'd be like, you know what? Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Get it. Get the information. But, but, no, no, it needs to be in the board packet for our community to see. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. So that's another agenda item I'm asking. Okay, you told me yes, we're going to discuss it, but there's no need to discuss it. Just put it in, what did you just put it in? No, no. We'll check that. Wendy, can you please just put it in there? No, that's... Wendy said that she was going to put it in there. Wendy, can you share with me why it's not in here? Um, why it's not in the board packet? I've asked a question, I want an answer from our staff, Kevin. Wendy, can you please? Okay, unless no. I am going to be terminated for telling you this, you have bullied me to the point of no return. I only said that because we needed to go on with the meeting. We had other board business that needed to So you lie to a board member. To the chair, I think we should be respectful as well. Would you like to fire me now? Go ahead. That's not that's not my decision to make. Yes, it is. No, it's not. That's what you want. No, you let her have me. No. You're fine. I quit. You're the one. No, no, no. No, I have to did. I didn't fire her. You do not trust me in any fashion whatsoever. Neither to do what you trust me. Mr. Mason or Ms. Blanco. You don't trust me. This has nothing and to do with trust. Chavez, you're falling into line. This has nothing to do with trust. Nothing to do with trust. I it's talking about, this is about communication Stop. and transparency. Stop. 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 Stop.
now then, because we can't do business now, Henry. Because you can't be telling Terry what you said to her and tell me to shut the hell up. How about you shut the hell up? No, you need to you need to have this conversation about her. Everybody just needs to t calm down. We need to finish going with the meeting. There's there's no need for a Mr. Martinez, I really do apologize for mixing up my arms. It's just, this is not my hour of glory. You should see me at five in the morning. I'm a much better person. It's just not my time. Um, again, once again, the board is requesting a waiver for Ed Code 41372. All the while, there is consistent to make salaries at the district and district administrators competitive with local districts and county averages. I only can hope that you make this same concerted effort when it comes to staff and teachers. As evidenced by the spreadsheet I provided the board at one of the closed session meetings, and I'm sorry if it was squished, it was a big sheet, um, so I had to scan it down. I'm happy to supply you with the original PDF um, if, if you would like that. Um, San Bruno continues to be last, or very near last, in the county in every step and column. When asked at the previous board meeting of the auditor, not of me, but of the auditor, how many other districts failed to meet this code, I remind you that the auditor said none, that we were the only ones that he had audited that didn't meet this code. So while I know that you will just approve this and it will go to the county and they will again just approve it. I will again meet with the county and make my case. And due to the fact that we are not negatively certified, it is my hope that one year they will finally listen to us. And for
force you to pay us. So it is my desire that we work together, that we make progress and realize that this gap can't be made up in one negotiating cycle. I understand that. I understand we are not Hillsborough. But I have been in this district 20 years. All I ask is collaboration and progress. Thank you. Yes, I, I missed the last meeting, so. For the, for the second reading, you said, oh, that's true. Yeah. You missed, you missed the first reading. Yes. Thanks for the information you provided me, Trustee Chavez. So, we have a motion on this? Make a motion to approve. Hold on. I want to pass a motion. Second. Second. Okay, so is that a concern for? Just want to comment. I think what, what you're discussing is, is up there on the screen. Is the paragraph that says the board president and the superintendent? Is that the paragraph?
think if we have so some saying is this, this, this is the mechanism that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. The board, when the board acts I, together. You are a different type of board president. When I was board president, and when John Marino was board president, and Mr. Mr. James Prescott was board president, they we never denied any any board members' request for an agenda item. But it just so happens that when you become board president, you tend to deny. I understand and I only trust that we have people who are elected by the community who are not going to come and put agenda items. Hey, you know what, the sky's blue, but I want to say it's green and have a separate conversation. Anything that has to do with the subject matter jurisdiction of anything within the, 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 the school district should should be put on. I, 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 I understand if you know if there's already maybe some, some topics, but I don't trust that we'll, that our community will be electing people to have this position to be putting on such, you know, frivolous the items on the agenda. Thank you. So, I, so I all, what I'm saying on the is that this, um, to go back to the board policy. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this has. And has have this they, they have. I'm still talking to Kevin and to staff to have this um, paragraph. Thank you. So what if this, it already has, and it's come back to us again. This is language adopted throughout the state. And it also does give the board the opportunity to have, to, to weigh in and to, to craft its agenda the way the board desires, but not one board member only. It's, okay, so you're saying that's going, right apply, is that, is that going to apply to the community as well? The, that if we have one community member to make a request from the board president and superintendent to have an item put on it, you're saying that they need another community member to say, hey, you guys can work with it on. And there's, there's a process within that for, within that for the testimony. Through the chair, it does say that there specifically that the president and superintendent shall decide whether to request from a member of the public is within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the board, so that's. And whether it's a request exactly. for information, and whether right. it's what, what type of request is it. But it's Some of those requests for information can be dispensed with by providing information. It doesn't necessarily have to. But, it, but then that also needs to apply to trustees. Yeah, so I mean, again, I, I think we're. This is yeah, all I, 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 asked, I asked um, to have something put on months ago, and it still hasn't reached the agenda. Do you, okay, let me ask the board then. Yeah. Let's take it this way. So, do you want to put the board item about where we sit? with the way we're sitting, but if you, but, let's do it. Let's let's have a small item, let's not spend a lot of time on it, but I'm okay with that. I, I think it's, yeah. it, is it frivolous? Yeah. It's frivolous. Okay. But hold on one second. Let's turn it over. Andy. No, I'm, 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 no, 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 no. Um, if, if it was so frivolous, Uh, that would be great, please enlighten me. Yes, I would like to know. I, because of the way you were pulling the CEO, and I couldn't see it being at one end of the table. Well, I do. I have not pulled the CBO. I have asked questions of staff, and as a trustee, that is my job, and I'm just doing my due diligence of asking staff questions. I was not pulling her. I was asking questions. Like I asked again to put the um, warrants in the um, yes. board okay. packet. So, so that's
That's going to follow the May 8th board meeting after we do the presentation. So the, the item number two, facilities transformation update, is regarding the is regarding really the the work that we're doing around the uh, fiscal recovery and measure X. The facilities update in June is simply an update to the board. That's a it's a it's a twice yearly update from maintenance operations and transportation.
otherwise the would be um, board vice president should take a look at the agenda design that's uh, in the state. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, perfect. And the, the last agenda topic would be a supply chain end to end. Um, essentially, we're hearing some issues around school supplies management. Um, it'd be good for trustees to understand that process end to end, how supplies come into the district, how they're distributed, managed, tracked. Um, just so we hear information, we can get objective information around supply chain. That's all. Not the most exciting topic, but it's could, very could relevant. That be, could that be supplies in a, in a report to the board in a weekend update? Sure, as long as it's publicly available. But it, is that publicly, uh, is that we can up, update publicly visible? No, no. Just information for Yeah, so, I, so just to clarify, I think the supply chain should be a, an agendized topic for open session. Reconsider our board positions. I'd like a recall of not a recall, but a, a revote on a reorganization. Um, so in May, I'd like for us to reorganize it to have a uh, reorganization. And how about the May? Yeah, I think we need uh, to have a, a revote on um, our board president. Yeah, we should discuss it. Um, this cabinet position is correct. This uh, is for, for discussion slash action. You're talking about changing that? I'm talking about discussing it as an agenda topic. But it's right? right to discussion and then we can take action. What's the board consensus? What's the reason? Well, all we need is one. I called CSBA to find out how we can go about doing this, and they said that all I need to do is make the request to the board president to have it at the next upcoming meeting. Okay. I'm making the request for agenda for item to be put on May's meeting so that we can discuss and take action on the re a revote on the reorganization of our positions here on the board. I am, I am openly re recalling our board president. I'd like to see the Terry or Andy step up. So for the next board meeting, I'm, agenda, I'm 
making a request, according to my conversation with people at the CSBA, on how to go about doing this. I don't think I'm doing anything illegal or wrong. I'm not looking for a percentage. Okay, all I need is one more board member. That's all we need is just to have the item they put on. I need one of you guys to say yes. That's it. According to the way the board policy is now. I, 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 I have to I have to see support. So what so can you can you clarify the agenda item the agenda item the agenda item for me the agenda item for me the board positions discussion regarding the board positions regarding board positions. I said that's fine if the agenda is a topic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are we agreeing with you? Thank you very much. It's just an agenda item. But for discussion slash action, so that we can choose to, after discussion, we can take action on the item. Thank you. Can I? I think it should be a discussion. Yes. Can I just want to be a chair of the meeting is beyond the meeting. I know, but I have one more thing for future business. Wait, wait, wait. So, um, um, Trustee Blanco and myself are, are part of the Children's Day for on April 27th for this year, and the Education Foundation reached out to me because they really want to help us next year. They want to help in regards to planning it and having an event planner and coordinator, and I thought that's a great idea. I spoke to Trustee Blanco about it because I know she's been doing this for the last 10 years. This is one of her favorite events. And so, Brian had mentioned they just wanted to make sure I discussed it with the whole board and have a board consensus. So I don't know if that needs to be in the agenda item or if it just needs to be because there's no way I could discuss this with five board members without being here at the meeting. Tell me, I would support that on the agenda. I think it's fantastic. On the agenda? Okay. So it's going to be the 2020 Children's Day. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Okay. So our future meetings are. For the chair, I just want to say one final thing before we adjourn. I think we should get along up here. Yes. I mean, I just can't overstate this. This is this is challenging work for staff and the board and the community. So let's work on it. We need to be respectful. Thank you, Jane.